PhDs can feel so weird and overwhelming, like there's no structure to them, but in fact, what we don't like to admit to ourselves is that there is a structure to a PhD, and if you follow this, it'll feel like cheating. So the first thing you need to know is that there's five steps, and I call it the scale kind of framework or blueprint. And the S, the first thing, stands for start with the end in mind. So what we've got to do is look at where we're ending up, and there's two levels in which we need to think about where we want to end up. The first thing we want to know is what a PhD thesis or a PhD outcome in your field looks like. And it's really simple. We need to turn it into the basic maths. You need to go through a thesis or like something that you want to emulate in your field. It needs to be kind of like adjacent to your field, if nothing else. And you want to go through and you want to have a look how long it is. So this one is like, you know, maybe 205, 260 pages, I noticed. And uh, it's got lots of figures. It's got lots of text. So I'll go through and be like, okay, how many individual figures are there in here? How many individual kind of like studies are there in here. Maybe it's one study per chapter like it is in here. That tells me what I need to do throughout my three, four, five plus years during my research. And then I can think about then managing that backwards and going, okay, if I need to do four big studies, one per chapter, and each chapter, each study has got like 20 figures, how does that look on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis? Do I need to produce one figure per week? Do I need to produce one figure every month? What is it? What what actually gets me to this bit? And starting with the end in mind means that you'll have kind of like somewhere to aim for because we don't like to admit that in fact a lot of them are very similar. If you were to look at someone else in this field, even in my research group, their thesis would be a similar thickness. It would be a similar amount of stuff inside because that's what it takes to convince someone that you're worthy of a PhD. So start with the end in mind. Have a look at theses from your research group, from other people in your research field around the world because that's what it takes to get a PhD in your field. Look at figures, look at the schematics, look at how many individual studies there are. That will give you something to aim for. And it's very important because sometimes we feel like a PhD is just this unstructured, unknown thing that we've got to kind of scramble together. Someone's already done it for you. You just need to find the data. And the second level to this start with the end in mind, which arguably is more important. What do you want to do at the end of your PhD? Do you want to go into academia? Do you want to go into to industry? Do you want to do something else completely? Because your PhD is going to look different to someone who wants to go into academia if you, like me, wanted to go into science communication or into industry or somewhere else. So you need to then know what you need to do through your PhD to make sure your ejection, your blah, out the other end of a PhD is actually sort of like not stressful and you've got all the skills and the networks that you need um, to make sure that that transition into your next career is seamless. Now the problem about this is if it's outside of academia it takes a little bit more work to put your fingers in those pies, get those little digits, those disgusting little sweaty digits into those pies but it's well worth it because if you know from the start where you want to go, if you've got an inkling, if nothing else, you'll know what you need to do to get to the end. And to be honest with you, so many PhD students don't think about this and it causes so much stress through their PhD, you're not gonna be one of them. Start with the end in mind in those two ways. The C in scale stands for create. Now, we need to create things at three different levels. Throughout your PhD, you need to create ideas. So let's have a look at a little bit of kind of a funnel, if you will. A little funnel. In it goes ideas. You need to be thinking about ideas pretty much all the time. You come up with an idea and then you go and do something about that idea. You come up with an idea, you evaluate it. Is it worth doing? Is it not worth doing? Then you pursue that idea to see what happens. Ideas are the currency, the backbone, the soup that you slurp up during your PhD and you need to be constantly slurping that idea soup because if you don't, you're just going to run out of things to do and you're going to feel lost. You're going to feel like you're just sort of like wandering around. Ideas are what keep things going. So create them regularly. Set aside time for looking at the literature and coming up with ideas. That's why we read the literature. It's not about sort of like sitting in the bath and going like, oh, that's a brand new idea that no one's ever thought about. You build it off the back of someone else's work and you think to yourself, oh, I wonder if they could have done this. I wonder if they did do this. I wonder if that is an awesome thing that I should explore. That is what ideas are all about. So you need to create ideas all the time. Oh, this stands for create. There we are, create. Number one, that's the first level. Create ideas throughout your PhD, especially important in the early part. And then we put ideas into our data. So we want to be creating 
data. So first of all, we create ideas. Secondly, we create data. Data, data, data. Create, create, create. Data takes a number of forms, whether or not it's raw data, whether, well, I'll write this down for you so it looks like I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so we got raw data. This is important because you need to go out and just produce raw data. And then after that, we look at analysis. And now, ooh, and now, like that. Um, and then we look at analysis. And then three, we talk about sort of presentation, you know, creating graphs, figures, nice things that we can publish and really sort of like persuade people that what we've done shows what we're saying it does. So then we end up with, I don't know, let's just say figures or outputs down the bottom. So then we're creating figs. This creating of data should be something you set aside time for every single week. Remember we said start with the end in mind? We know how many figures we need to produce roughly for our research field. We know how many times we need to produce sort of like data. So make sure you are constantly producing data. If you have a regular research sort of like seminar or regular meeting with your supervisors, make sure you have new data and new ideas to put forward to them every single time because that means you are creating. A PhD relies on creating, creating, creating. And that brings us to the last bit. Uh, we've got output. So here, the output for creating out hurt okay then we've got three we need to create output what does that look like it looks like figures oh i've dropped my pen i'm back it looks like creating figures. It looks like creating papers right before you are ready. Look at the figures you've got. Put together stories. An output is a story. Let's put that there. An output is essentially a research story that you can tell. It has this idea, it has this data, and it has this conclusion. Super, super easy. You need to be creating these throughout your PhD. If you're not creating, you're not PhDing. The next thing we need to look at is A, which stands for automate. You need to automate the processes as much as possible now with AI tools and sort of code that you can create yourself. And you can do that with AI tools as well. Create your own little code micro things. Um, anyway, what I mean by that is each one of these you can actually automate ideas. We are now really good at coming up with ideas. Why is that not working? Donk. Donk. Okay. Ah, that was white out. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. Automate, there we are. We need to automate the idea generation. Automating the idea generation means going to AI tools like Elicit, like SciSpace, like Consensus, and just coming up with ideas. Using semantic search, going to these tools and thinking, hmm, is this an idea that I should pursue? Is it interesting to me? Does it fit in with my research? That is so very important. So automate the idea creation by going to these AI tools and asking semantic questions. If you have an idea pop into your head, boom, put it in. If you've got an interesting paper, put that paper into an AI tool like ChatGPT, DeepSeek, wherever you want to put it and say, hey, what are some ideas that can be kicked out from the back end of this research? It will help you come up with those ideas because sometimes caffeine just isn't enough. We also can automate some of the data. Now, I don't mean come up with the data. I mean presenting the data and, um, and analyzing the data. Tools like Julia, AI are great at getting that first touch, Julius. Oh no, there's a U in there. Okay, like this. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Okay, Julius AI, fantastic at helping you with that first pass over your data. So upload that data to Julius AI and think to yourself, hmm, I wonder what I can do with this data. What does this show you? If you're not even sure, you can say, I'm doing this as part of this research project and explain the research project. What conclusions do you think I can get from this data? And use that as your sort of like delving, your diving in point, splash, um, your diving in point to that data, create data, analyze that data, and you can even create the outputs and the figures now with Julius AI, you can even create lovely little bar charts, you can even create nice schematics, scatter graphs, all sorts of stuff is now a available to be automated, go check it out. Um, and also then we can automate that output as well. We can automate that output by having our research story and then saying, I need to create this research story, create it for me. You can use loads of AI tools. I prefer ChatGPT Canvas, but I know loads of academics absolutely love Claude for helping automate that output. You need to put your own ideas in, your own data sort of like conclusions in, but it will help you create that first 
first draft of your research project. Automation has never ever been so easy in a PhD. You just need to make sure you use it ethically and you use it to support you writing, support you creating, rather than doing the like, from nothing creation process. I think that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. All right, then that is automation AI tools. This whole channel is about it. So go check out my uh, channel. Go have a look at all of the AI tools I've reviewed. And also go check out this video where I talk about the top AI tools for 2025. And I think you'll absolutely find something in there that will automate the shit out of your PhD. The L in scale stands for leverage. So there we are. Oh, we're starting to run out of space. I'll use a new color. Let's have a look. Let's go this one. Leverage. All right. As a PhD student, you don't have much leverage, but what you do have as leverage is time and freedom. You've got a number of years to actually explore ideas that are interesting to you and your research supervisor. The way you can leverage that is by having a multi threaded project. Now, this is what I mean is as you're going along with your project, you only need one idea to start it off. You're like, oh, I like that idea. Let's carry on. I'm going to sort of explore that. I'm going to get data from that. And when you've got data, from that, then you think, oh, actually, I also think I should explore this thing. And then you end up with these parallel research projects. These parallel research projects are your leverage and also your insurance to make sure that your PhD isn't just one big sort of like book of failure. Mine now is a book of lies because this has all been superseded with new information. However, that is what every good thesis turns into eventually. Anyway, I am sidetracked. When we end up with leverage, we end up, uh, okay, down here with multi-thread. And then we continue this one and this research project. And then maybe we get some more data. Maybe it comes off this project and we're like, oh, we like that idea. And you're always sort of like keeping track of all of these different sort of ideas. And we're creating data and outputs for each one of them. And every so often, something just won't work. It just will not work. It will fail. And that's when we can get rid here. I'll make it a nice big red color so we're we're not confused. We get rid of that research track. Maybe that one and that one for some reason just didn't work. We don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the equipment. The actual idea um, didn't sort of like pan out in the end. But by having these multi-threaded research projects means that then when something goes wrong, we're not panicking. And it's important that even in sort of like the smallest of research fields, you can always take a little bit of a sidestep out and follow a new idea in parallel to what you're doing. And by doing that, as as you get closer to completion, you'll have sort of like the things that are working. Another thing in leverage that I absolutely love and I've talked about on this channel a lot is the 80-20 principle where you have a look every so often at the research that you're doing and you ask yourself, what 20% of my efforts are giving me 80% of the results? Those are going to be the things that sort of like carry you through to a PhD and it's going to get rid of the things that you're spending a lot of time and effort on but actually aren't giving you the rewards, which is the data the outputs that you need to get to a PhD. You may like some of these more than the others, but it's better to kill it early so it doesn't sort of like eat into that leverage, which is your time and freedom. And then at the end, you'll see that all of these things come together into a nice PhD. Oh, there we are. Nice PhD. Everyone's happy. Your supervisor's happy. And you haven't wasted all that time chasing stuff that isn't working. So leverage is you don't have much of it, but that's what you do have. And it's probably the most important thing, time and freedom. Use it wisely. And the last thing you need to know about the E in scale is expertise. You need to exploit expertise. What does that mean? Well, during a PhD, you are surrounded by minds, by people's minds, by experts. Those experts can be postdocs. They can be sort of like third year PhD students nearing completion. They can be actual sort of like tenured professors, but you are su surrounded by minds and so few PhD students actually leverage the expertise around them and exploit it to the point where it's sort of valuable for them. One thing I like to do during any sort of research project, I've done it heaps. It's just sort of like arrange a meeting with someone who's adjacent to your research field in your department or ask to speak to like the senior researcher or senior postdoc in your lab and say, hey, could we sit down and talk about this? And everyone's going to absolutely love doing that because it's going to distract them from their own internal thoughts about why they're even doing all this research and academia stuff in the first place. A welcome distraction, if you ask me. So here we have um, exploit exploit, exploit,
expertise. All right, this is where you're gonna reach out to people and you're gonna exploit them for their minds. This means that if you have a research project or a paper that you just want someone to look over, send it out to them. Say, hey, would you mind taking a look over this? Obviously, if you're allowed to and all the sort of like data security stuff is all right. But you can say, hey, is this good? Actually, some of the best things I learned during my PhD wasn't from reading, wasn't from sitting down with a thesis, wasn't from sitting down looking over sort of Google Scholar. It was actually conversations with academics and experts in different fields. I used to sit down with uh, sort of like a mentor regularly who wasn't even in my field, but he would often bring like another viewpoint. It's not about the hmm, techniques. It's not about the individual kind of like systems and methods you use, it's about having someone clever look at what you're doing and go, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? Exploit it as much as you can. This is probably one of the only times in your life if you don't decide to stay in academia where you are surrounded by brilliant minds. They may be weird, they may have hairy ears, their nose hair is long, but they have brilliant minds. It's kind of like a balancing game. You get a good mind, but you get hairy ears. We've all been there. Anyway, this is your time to actually exploit their expertise. If you have a paper that you're not sure is quite ready just yet, send it to them and say, hey, I'm not quite sure this is ready, but would you take a look at it? And they'll absolutely do it because one thing academics love is being super critical, criticable? <laughs> critical about other people's work. They absolutely love it and uh, they will jump at the chance to be a little bit mean to you in writing. Uh, don't take it personally, they just love doing it. So exploit expertise and that brings us to the end. Scale, start with the end in mind, create, create, create ideas, create data, create outputs, automate everything you can. This is the world and time of automation. automation automation. I've been talking for too long. Leverage. Make sure you leverage the two things PhD students have, which is freedom to explore what you want quite often, depending on your supervisor, and also time. Make sure that you're able to sort of create a multi-threaded project that you weave together at the end, killing off stuff that doesn't work as you go, and exploit that expertise because it's there to be exploited. They absolutely love it, and it will help you no end. If you like this video, check out this one where I talk about getting published in Scopus Index journals fast and efficiently. I think you'll love it. And it's very important because publishing is the backbone of academia and it's going to make everyone and you look awesome. Anyway, go check it out.